right, I think we've got plenty of people online, so we'll make a start. Um, so welcome to our webinar today. This is the first of two events um, we at Allen Nobury are hosting together with Governors for Schools. I'm a partner at Allen Nobury, uh, I'm Jane Higgins, and I've been a trustee of Governors for Schools for nearly three years. I have a few housekeeping points to mention. We are recording this session. Everyone in the audience has been muted and um, we do have a question and answer um, session scheduled for the end and also after each panelist has spoken. So please do send your questions in. There's a question and answer function um, in your webinar controls. Um, that's the housekeeping over. So just a bit of background on what we're going to talk about today. At ANO, we have been supporting educational programmes for a long time and particularly um, programmes that work with challenging schools and young people who are, are persistently disadvantaged and in particular we're looking at um, holistic ways to address and prevent unnecessary exclusions. Um, we want to try and help head teachers, governors, students, parents and school governors of course find solutions to, to help ensure that no student is unnecessarily excluded from their, from their right to an education. We have four fantastic panellists joining us today. Um, we have Edward Timpson MP, who is the author of the 2019 Timpson Report into the use of exclusion in the English education system. We have Jamie Rogers, who is a former head teacher and is now head of recruitment and community at The Difference. We have Jessica West, who's a head teacher at Arc Walworth Academy in London. And we have Samira Caterina Monteleone, who's a student, a member of the UK Youth Parliament and an advocate for better education and the reduction of youth violence. So we'll hear from our panellists for um, a few minutes and after each panellist has spoken, I'll, I'll ask them a couple of questions before uh, we move on to the next person. And at the end, we should have, hopefully we'll have 15 minutes for um, lots of questions. So, so please do send them in. So that's pretty much enough from me and we're going to make a start with Jamie. So Jamie is a experienced primary school leader, as I mentioned he um, has been a head teacher and was one of the youngest head teachers in the country and was certified by Ofsted as leading by example to transform the safeguarding culture and behaviour ethos of an inadequate school within six months. Jamie has been looking ahead to the aftermath of COVID and the challenges that have been brought by that. And he's now at The Difference as Head of Recruitment and Community. And Jamie, I'm hoping you can tell us a bit about your work there and, and how that impacts on school exclusions. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. So hopefully um, in just a moment, there we go. You can see my slides just there. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Jane. I'm Jamie Rogers. I'm a head teacher um, of a prime. Well, I was a head teacher for a primary school, and I work for the difference. Um, and I'm also a governor of an SEMH school. So I've seen exclusion from many different perspectives, and I've been putting some thought recently into um, exclusion, particularly from the viewpoint of governors. And um, so it's useful for me to start by talking through some of the work that my current organisation, the difference, which is a charity that aims to reduce exclusions does um, and kind of where that work came from initially. So initially the difference was was formed by um, CEO Kieran Gill um, and our director of operations at the moment Danny Swift and they undertook some research with IPPR and that research culminated in the 2017 report Making the Difference. The Making the Difference report set out some really big questions. It was one of the largest studies into school exclusions um, to date. Uh, and the, the big questions that they, they set, out, set out with were around who, who gets excluded, how big is the problem of exclusion, what happens to excluded pupils, and why was exclusion at that moment in time on the rise? So the report was released in 2017 in October, and some of the big conclusions that, that, that it came to and the, and, the, and the key findings that I'm going to explore on the next slide. It found that exclusion affects the most vulnerable pupils more than anyone else. Some of the stats on the screen here kind of put that to the test. 20 times more likely to have contact with social services, four times more likely to live in poverty, and seven times more likely to have special educational needs and a whopping 10 times more likely to have mental health issues. All these things are particularly pertinent to the times that we're living through at the moment as schools return after, after lockdown. And um, 
But es essentially, for governors, this should prompt some some key questions, particularly in meetings, governor governor meetings as well. The key questions that I think it, it leads us to as governors uh, are around: Do we know which children in our schools? Do all staff know which children have had historic contact with social services? If a child's had contact with social services, that means things were so difficult in their family life that it led to outside involvement of an agency. If teachers know that information, they can make much more, or they can be more vigilant potentially in, in spotting behavior changes that may be indicative of safeguarding issues as well. But also, if there are children in school at governor meetings when we're, we're analyzing uh, behavior patterns or exclusion patterns, if, if governors are asking the questions around which of the children who fall into more than one of these categories that we think are at risk, could we prepare an at-risk of exclusion list that we could explore to see what kind of interventions are being put in place at the right time to support these pupils? The report also found that children of different ethnicities are disproportionately affected by exclusion. Black Caribbean children uh, are more than four times more likely to be excluded. Children of a white and black Carib Caribbean dual heritage two and a half times more likely to be excluded, children from a Roma Gypsy background, three times more likely to be excluded uh, pr proportionately, and Irish traveler heritage children, 17 times more likely to, to be excluded. And, and for governors, as exclusions come through the pipeline, uh, potentially if you're sat on, on panels, key questions uh, are to be raised around what, what is the pattern in, in our school? And those questions and discussions happening with head teachers are a great starting point to open discussions. Uh, around exclusions, particularly from a governance stance point. The IPPR report also busted a myth around children, essentially the people involved in, in panels, potentially make the decision makers, suggesting that children might, might find better elsewhere or, or other schools, alternative education may be better better place to support particular children with particular needs. And while it's very, very true that the best APs and the best proofs do this with a plum and they and, and, and they produce great outcomes for, for pupils, not every child that 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 is educated in alternative provision gets the attainment outcomes that we would like them to. Less than two percent of these children receive a good pass mark in English or maths at GCSE. A half of them are out of education by 16 and 90% of teenagers who find themselves in custody have been excluded at some point. The implication, implications for governors here, uh, particularly in those difficult meetings, uh, uh, to ask the questions around, is provision likely to be better elsewhere? Have we exhausted all avenues within, within our current resources and within our school as well? If a child finds themselves in alternative education, potentially the well, the, the statistics in 2017 showed that they're twice as likely to have a long term supply teacher. This makes it very difficult for children to build relationships when that is the scenario they find themselves with, particularly with the teachers. And that protective relationship is a key factor uh, in, in making sure that children succeed in alternative provision too. Half as likely in alternative provision as well to have a qualified teacher. These stats are pretty sobering, particularly, you know, we know that there are great APs and proofs out there, but these sobering stats are the national picture, or they were the national picture in 2017, and the impact of the pandemic potentially could have worsened some of these statistics. Uh, we're, not, we're not too sure on the research of that at the moment, but does everyone involved in making key decisions about exclusion in your school know these statistics, and do they inform things for you as well? That led Kieran and Danny uh, to, do, to do some solution focused thinking and, and they spoke to different school leaders around um, what, what could improve that picture. This included governors, it included head teachers, lots of schools around the country. And the things that, that came up were on the screen at the moment, but uh, essentially uh, there was a thirst for a leadership program that could potentially solve or reduce some of these problems. And it's worth saying that the difference doesn't believe in no exclusions whatsoever. Um, but it is seeking to reduce exclusions. Danny and Kieran went away, the difference went away and spoke to the best alternative provisions um, and found these things. Not, not everybody recognised the expertise that lives in alternative provision. So particularly at the moment when we're thinking about the pandemic, it's really worth noting that 
the skills in the best APs to, to support and understand mental health, to work multi-agency and, and, and to initiate and unlock um, that kind of support from, from social services, children's services uh, and early intervention lives in APs. And that expertise is going to be particularly relevant as we come out of the pandemic. This led Karen and Danny uh, to form the difference. Um, and the difference's mission is to improve the outcomes uh, for the most vulnerable by raising the status and expertise of those who teach them. And that's achieved in three ways, influencing people, practice and policy. So there are two flagship programs um, that the difference uh, uh, has designed and runs at the moment. The difference leaders program, which involves people applying middle leaders and senior leaders in schools applying to work for two years in alternative provision building up an armory of inclusive practice. And then at the end of those two years, coming back to mainstream school to spread the good practice was the ultimate aim of reducing exclusion. The other thing which is particularly um, probably poignant and relevant for, for governors who are with us today is the Differences Inclusive Leadership course. And this is designed for anybody who wants to strategically improve inclusion of all kinds in school, but also to reduce exclusion. It's for mainstream school leaders as well as alternative provision school leaders. And we focus on the things and deliver expert training um, in the things pictured on the screen right now um, with the ultimate aim of, of building inclusive practice in all schools, asking the right questions, having a data focused approach, looking at what trends and patterns are, uh, emerge in schools, as well as kind of key areas of practice that schools can benefit, benefit from. So, and um, this could be contextual safeguarding, trauma-informed practices, bias-aware practices. Um, and that model is something that we're working with schools such as art schools, Dixons, but uh, prominent local authorities such as Cheshire West and Chester. We're working with those schools right now and capturing impact um, uh, uh, just, just to how inclusion is improved uh, and, and how we're reducing the risk of exclusion as well. So Jane, that's... Um, essentially a quick guide into the IPPR report on making the difference and the work of the difference um, but be delighted to answer any questions uh, now as well. That's fantastic thank you Jamie. Um, I think it was your second slide you shared some very um, sobering statistics on um, yeah how, how excluded children it doesn't affect everybody equally and um, different groups are more excluded than others. What can governors do to, to look into this and, and help their schools um, investigate how, it, how exclusions are impacting on different groups? Yeah, it's a, re it's a great question, Jane. I think for, from my experience in school, um, when I was in a school with, with some behaviour challenges, it's fair to say, um, uh, and when I first joined it, it was a school in special measures. Behaviour wasn't always um, what we'd expected it to be as part of the trust that I was working in. Um, however, it was very easy to see which children were at risk of these things, which children fell into these categories, uh, and some children fell into all of these categories, some some one, some two. Um, but analysing that list of, of pupils of who we recognise are, are at risk of exclusion was a really powerful tool that, that I experienced. And, and then explaining outwardly to governors who asked the right questions, just what is it we're doing for the, these children? What does intervention look like? How do you know it's working? So I always think with governors, it's it's those key questions. There's no such thing as a bad question for a governor, but really sharpening the lens around which children are at risk of exclusion, noticing any trends in, in, you know, in groups and patterns and things like that, and really targeting the support to, 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 to what's needed in context specific um, needs of your, your, your school or any, any given school. Th thank you, Jamie. There's a, lo a lot of questions on similar themes actually coming up. Um, one question is um, connected to those is, do, do we know why these groups are disproportionately affected? Um, so, so essentially there are, there, there are different, nothing, the IPPR report hints and suggests some, some potential reasons for, for this. So, for, for example, we know that boys are statistically three times more likely to be excluded than girls. And some of that may be that we recognize, teachers recognize, and, and this, is, this, is, this is a stereotype, but it's potentially one that other teachers would recognize as well, that it's easier to potentially adultify the behavior of boys as being aggressive, of being um, deliberately provocative. So that there, are, there are anecdotal reasons like that. In terms of the quantifiable reasons, I think um, 
involvement with social services, having experienced that experiences of um, trauma in that way, or, or, or so things being so bad that children's services need to, to to be involved. That kind of connection is probably quite apparent to teachers, and, and we'd notice that um, given the home context difficulties that can sometimes relate to poor behaviour in school. Not always, but sometimes. So, so there are different kind of links and um, that, that that the report leads to as well but i think some of that potentially is is work that school leaders need to be doing at particular school level um because you know that is place specific the needs of different communities in different areas is very different as well thanks so much jamie we'll come back to some more <clears throat> excuse me we'll come back to some more questions at the end but in the meantime i'm going to move on to jessica as i mentioned jessica is a principal at the Ark Walworth Academy in central London and Jessica School does have a cohort who face significant socio-economic deprivation and where there's a high risk statistically of exclusion but actually Jessica's Academy is proud of its record for having the lowest permanent and fixed term exclusion rates in the network so Jessica I'd love to hear more about that please. Thank you, Jane, um, and thanks for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, well, I've been asked to talk about um, anti-exclusion strategies in school and a kind of practical level, but also how governors can then play their part in it. So for me, having worked in, in South London schools, particularly over time, uh, there are two probably key parts to this. And I should you know, declare my colours as Jamie did. I'm actually not anti-exclusion as a, a general position. I do believe that exclusion is necessary on occasion, um, but that it is beholden on us as school leaders, school governors, to try and reduce the instances in which we are using that. Um, you, you say absolutely correctly, Jamie, that some AP is absolutely brilliant, really effective, gets young people fantastic outcomes. But as school leaders and school governors, I start from the beginning position that we believe that our school is probably the best place for most children and if we if we believe that we're going to try and keep hold of them so i think there are two key positions for governors um, one of those is policy and one of those is process around the input to process that happens in school but i should say that i think that the key role for governors really is well before you reach an exclusion panel because on that day at that time you are really only considering what one case and if we're talking about effective reduction of multiple exclusions that's going to be looking at the the underlying structures rather than the individual case that's in front of you so in the first place thinking about your policy of course there are certain statutory things that are really really important so we know that it isn't okay to have a zero tolerance policy that actually all cases should be considered on their merits but when we say that do we really mean it or as a governor, just as a thought exercise for yourself, as a school leader or a governor, are there some red lines for you? So if I say to you, a child has brought a knife into school, are you thinking to yourself, yes, that's over the line for me? Um, because there may be bespoke circumstances. So if I give some color to that and say to you, a child has brought a butter knife into school in their lunchbox with um, some cheese that they'd like to cut up and share. Does that give a certain context that makes it slightly different for you or actually are you thinking to yourself that's that's not okay similarly if I tell you that um, a uh, a girl in year nine has brought in a kitchen knife and it's been reported to us because she's attempting to self-harm does that change the context and if those things are important I would encourage governors to ask why what is it about those circumstances that make them exceptional for you and see if you can characterize the why because actually a set of blanket scenarios isn't helpful as we know as school leaders that we face extraordinary stories every day and the circumstances are everything of everything are completely bespoke um, but a set of principles or guidance that you might or questions indeed to ask around a scenario are really helpful does it matter to you for example whether the incident was quite public does it matter to you whether it's public or private and other young people or other families know about it so a set of questions um, that reframe that for you and for the school can be a really good uh, addendum to a policy that you might use to error check something but that that's got to go in quite nice and early 
The other thing that a why question helps us with is checking our own biases because a child who's brought a butter knife in their lunchbox who's going to share um, some cheese, that's quite a middle class thing to do. And I think it's probably right to say that the experience of most school leaders in the country was quite a successful one at school. The experience of quite a lot of school governors was quite a successful one at school. And so things that fall into particular tranches of behaviours that we might recognise, we can typically feel an awful lot more comfortable to excuse than things that we don't recognise. Um, and there are questions to ask about all sorts of offences that students might commit. For example, if you are new to the country from a South American country and you bring fireworks to school, were well, you actually just attempting to, to celebrate something and didn't understand the laws around fireworks in this country? Um, does that make a difference for you? I don't know. Um, but th those why questions around a policy and having an addendum that challenges that are really, really helpful. And that's something quite quick that you can come to as a set of questions. You don't have to provide the answers that will will help to quality assure those those decisions and the conversation for school leaders who are making those decisions. I think um, the other thing that Jamie said that I would say is, is a really important thing around policy is the, the data that you're asking for from your school or you're receiving for from, you, from your school in meetings, is it actually telling you what you need to know? So it's fine to kind of report detentions um, and, you know, the number of students who have incurred a particular sanction, but is it helping you to identify who the at-risk groups might be? Um, there was a fantastic piece of data around um, knife crime that came out of the Mayor for London's office recently, which obviously only helps Londoners, but saying that actually the, the key indicator, lead indicator of um, input for criminality for young people isn't always permanent exclusion from schools, although we, we can see a direct line there, but actually multiple fixed term exclusions places young people at significant risk of criminality. Um, and if you're not looking at who you're, if you're looking at single exclusions, fixed term exclusions, instead of repeat offenders, sometimes those things can uh, be disguised. So in, on the policy side, making sure that your data that you're requesting and that you're interrogating actually helps you to identify which young people might be at risk. Um, from a process led side, I think that there is a huge amount to be done in schools about working in partnership. So. Um, for us, that means working with the local authority. It means working with our local um, alternative provision. Um, it means working with local schools. It means moving young people uh, between uh, settings for short periods of time, for bespoke interventions. And that can only really happen through solid relationships and negotiation. From a governor's standpoint, it means asking what the, what the situation is. Um, for example, do you know if your local authority accepts managed transfers or if, or if it doesn't? Um, there is huge variation across the country in that. Um, but of course, if, if, if you're looking at managed transfers, there is the possibility that students might then see it out of themselves out of alternative provision on the other side without a permanent exclusion, having had some really good intervention. Similarly, you can't really expect that if your school isn't receiving young people in from alternative provision, that actually you can hope that that's going to happen for a young person you move on from your school. So it's a good question for head teachers. Are you working closely enough with your local provision? And are you taking those young people who have maybe been permanently ex excluded and now rehabilitated back into your cohort? Um, because, you know, that's the only way we can guarantee that there's a happy educational ending for these young people. Um, so that partnership working is really important. The only other thing that I would say on process driven stuff is about setting a journey because Jamie highlighted some really important statistics about the level of risk and the factors that we can identify that uh, around young people's personal circumstances that might place them at risk. And um, the question that was posed, I think, by Jane was why? Um, and we feel particularly in our our context that a number of those factors, acute mental health, intervention from social services, often debt, um, uh, criminality in the home, poverty, all of those sorts of things actually reduce executive function for young people and for families. They're asking people to work on a very short term basis a lot of the time. Um, we know that we can see it even through structures in society, things like payday loans. Um, manage it in the short term, but we're not quite sure what's going to happen in the long term. 
And so having a, a behavior policy that escalates and signposts for young people and families at very regular intervals what the consequences and the escalation will be so that at no circum at no point does an exclusion ever come as a surprise either to a family or to a young person is absolutely critical in helping them to be part of the journey that manages themselves and that is something that school leaders have to put in place but governors can help by asking to look at those documents asking to review those processes and critically in an ideal world the first time that governors meet a young person really ought not to be my personal view at an exclusion hearing ideally you really want to put that governor's review panel in earlier down your process so that both the young person and the family and any other stakeholders can come around that at table and think about what it feels like to be at risk, to experience that process, to know the level of formality, to get an opportunity to advocate for themselves, to explain things, and that that's not suddenly new when it's incredibly high stakes and it's the it's the only it's the only time they've got. So I would say that the two in-school processes definitely have to be about partnership working and setting a journey for and expectations and milestones along that process that enable young people and families to be part of it and able to regulate and govern themselves without surprises. Um, those are the things that we have found very, very successful in our current context and indeed in my previous school um, that I would say are kind of the practical steps but I'm happy to take any a couple of questions uh, that arise from that now or happily equally happy at the end. Thank you, Jessica. I'll, I'll just ask you briefly um, about a few questions that have arisen around red lines, zero tolerance, to what extent an exclusions policy should or shouldn't be looking at one isolated instant as opposed to a period of behaviour. Just welcome any thoughts you have on that. Well, there are two types of exclusion really, aren't there? And one of them is for a significant one-off incident that feels like a red line. Um, and one of them is going to be for repeated or persistent breach. Um, persistent breach is what we were talking about before with the signposting all the way through. Um, I, My view would be that you can't really have a list of things that are just, you know, th this, is, this is a one-off that, that will get you gone. Now, there is a difficulty around how you communicate that to your school community um, and, and by that one really mean students students cannot afford to think that they're coming back after bringing weapons or drugs to site for example those are usually the the two that people feel are absolute deal breakers um, so you will want something in your policy that says possible con conclusions for this sort of behavior will could well include permanent exclusion from school uh, we talk a lot about loss of place because loss of place could actually um, it, that's the sanction for the young person, but in terms of their onward journey, that might involve a managed move, again, working in partnership. It might involve um, some intervention, short-term intervention with another destination afterwards. It could involve managed transfers, um, or it could involve an exclusion. But uh, the idea of loss of place gives you some thinking space to innovate about what the solution would be, but the consequence for the rest of the school community is still very transparent. Um, I think that it, for me, I wouldn't ever have a this is this is an offence that will see you excluded. We'll always talk about how the, the possible conclusions and the likely conclusions uh, um, for, uh, consequences of this behaviour would be loss of place at school. But that gives us enough wriggle room to work out something that is bespoke and meaningful for the young person, because in the same way that you might use a fixed term exclusion because it's it's available to you. Actually, one of the key questions is, is that fixed term exclusion genuinely a sanction for the young person? Or actually, would you be better off coming up with something that offers them the chance to work quietly, reflect on what they've done, have some intervention and move forward from there? Thank you so much, Jessica. I think we could talk for a long time on that, but we're going Definitely. to move on to talk to Samira Caterina Monteleone now. Samira is a third year student at the University of Essex and she's studying politics and international relations. Samira has been involved with the UK Youth Parliament, the British Youth Council and the Youth Violence Commission report and she's an advocate for better education and the reduction of youth violence. So Samira over to you. Thank you Jane, hopefully you all can hear me. Um, thank you for that introduction. 
a lot I want to start by saying that I have never been put into a, a position where I ended up in an AP or a PRU or being put into a position where uh, exclusion was um, was a chance. However, I have friends that have had positive, but majority have had negative experiences with APs, PRUs, but also the process coming up to being excluded. Um, I want to start off by saying that the impact of exclusions for me personally, I feel that when it comes to looking at um, a student being excluded, APs and people referral units are too easy accessible for our mainstream schools currently. Um, as Jessica had mentioned briefing, one of the questions was, is it a sanction for that person? Is it too accessible for the school? Um, and it links to my idea and thing I want to talk about environment and location and its impact on the student. If a student is vulnerable or susceptible to grooming, um, to youth violence, where that AP or people refer unit may be, may actually um, make that possibility higher and that can be actually unsafe. And that's where you see the attainment levels and attendance um, decrease. So it's also, I think, when it comes to APs, which is meant to be short term, are, is the mainstream school engaging with that student, engaging with the AP to actually get them back into mainstream school? Is that something that they want to actually see? And I think it's important. I feel, as I said before, APs are too accessible for mainstreams, but they're not seen as short term provision anymore, rather more than a sanction or long term. Um, the second part I want to talk about is language. When it comes to a young person being involved in discussion, or being labelled is very much you are a child in an AP or a pupil referral unit. A lot of these times, these actual schools and these alternative um, education places have names. You don't need to refer them as a child in an AP, but you can actually refer them to a name. For example, there's a pupil referral unit in my area called Brent River College. You can refer to them as a student that goes to Brent River College. Those small things can have a massive impact on a young person. And um, as adults and school leaders, I feel we don't understand the impact of language. But moreover, I feel when it comes also to language to look at the way we explain to the young person the difference between an AP and a people fair unit, that can easily allow that young person to feel a sense of control um, over the situation, understand what is happening, how can they actually maybe contribute to preventing them actually being excluded. Um, more I want to talk about the stigmatization. A lot of young people that end up in an AP and which has been of my friends, for example, was labeled as always scatty, naughty, and wanting to cause disruption. But he was only diagnosed in the second year of university as having dyslexia, explaining so many of those behavioral problems that ended in, that made him end up in an AP in the first place. My question is, if there was diagnosis, if our teachers were made aware of things like dyslexia and the services out there to get them tested, would that have changed his whole narrative of his life and his journey to university? He's one of the many few of young people that I know that have attended an AP or a pupil fair unit that have gone to university. And one of my thoughts for governors and school leaders is how are we raising the aspirations of our young people in APs or pupil fair units to actually attend university? It's something that I've seen there's such a gap within research itself. Another thing I want to talk about when it comes to young people is the visibility. There are so many young people that are under child protection plans that fall under the radar, not only of our teachers, but also of our school leaders and SLT. There, sometimes in my school, when I was a student four years ago, and it's the same with my brothers now, they have one safeguarding teacher that knows everything. But actually, that young person under child protection plan may go through a, a terrible month where their parents could be going to court in regards to their custody, and it can explain the lashing out. However, because APs and people referring it, in my opinion, are too accessible for mainstream schools, it's used as a sanction and a quick fix, rather not having the student's intention at heart. This could be easily resolved, in my opinion, with policy in regards to better training of our teachers, of being able to highlight these, um, these issues but also um, becoming more empathetic when um, looking at exclusions. And it comes down to with governors before that meeting, like Jessica said, having constant conversations and having that conversation with that young person alone, not with someone there, not with um, parents, not with so many people. It can actually be quite daunting for a young person. And from a position where they feel like they've never been cared for, actually having that conversation can make them feel that they're important and their voice matters which I think is a massive thing and also again links back to language. I also want to mention that when a young person is being excluded how do we make them feel important within that decision? How do we give them an opportunity to grasp it? Because a lot of the time depending on their environment and who they're with 
can affect how they come across. And actually, a lot of young people don't want to be excluded. They don't understand the, the impact of being excluded and how, how much it can actually affect their personal development, but also their future education. You don't have to be there till 16, 18. And after that, you feel lost. And last you go to university, you don't have that support network anymore. So partially for me as, as for governors in creating changes, ensuring that, you know, young people understand what is being said in that meeting um, and making them a key, key stakeholder in that meeting too. Um, but also looking at data, um, understanding before they, the transition between year six to year seven, are they going to be highlighted as a possible um, young person that could be sent to an AP? I think that is also important. There's so many prevention things you can do um, with that. Um, and my last point is information. I feel that there's the way we pass information within our um, within our systems, within our institutions, is very poor. Um, it doesn't have the young person, the student in mind. It rather has what is best effective for these institutions, what is quicker, what is easier for them, rather than not the student. And I feel like the way we look has to change. It has to have notions of wanting to integrate those young people back into mainstream school if there's the possibility, um, but also which is the best way to help that young person with spreading information. Um, I don't feel we communicate with multi-agents, especially when it comes to the social care system. There are so many information that schools don't even realise, and nor do maybe that child's young person's key worker. So there's a lot of themes, a lot of ideas, but in regards to, to like conclude, it's the environment, the location of that young person of the school, um, the language, making it inclusive, making the young person feel involved, um, information, maybe looking at reviewing the way our our schools, maybe if that's with the working with the local authority in best practice of passing on information, but also ensuring that there's trust that that young person feels they have someone that they can trust. So when it comes to maybe that exclusion meeting, not it's not necessarily inviting their parents, maybe allowing that young person to select someone that they trust, whether that's a teacher, whether that's an older sibling, whether that's an older family member, that they feel that they can really have use of within that meeting, not necessarily just a parent. Some children, some young people don't engage with their parents and it doesn't work. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Samira. There was a lot of nodding heads from our panelists and also supportive comments from, from people listening. So um, what you said obviously resonated. And actually I, I had a question for you, which is, do you have any ideas, Samira, for how schools and governors can hear more from a young person's voice or a student's voice like you shared with us today? I think it's engaging with young people more so this is a brilliant start but I'm not someone with personal experience so sometimes I think it is useful having someone with that experience that can correlate but um, some schools have student bodies so engaging with the student bodies but ensuring that there's representation from those groups from those minority groups um, I think, again, like I said before, giving them the opportunity to voice their opinion, if there's no platforms, how do you expect to understand the issues that are going on? Um, but being empathetic, not just, I feel as a young person working with things like UK Parliament, British Youth Council, it can sometimes feel very, very tokenistic as a young person. I'm just invited to tick a box, whereas ensuring that there is support for that young person because there will be there will be conversations that are quite difficult is there someone on side that there's a room available for that young person to then maybe leave and have that conversation to calm down so just ensuring that there is support but also um avenues that young people don't feel like they're being used rather they're just being listened to that's brilliant thank you samira we are hoping to come back to um, a panelist session shortly to hear from Edward Timpson MP on the um, Timpson review of exclusions. Um, but we're just sorting out some technical issues behind the scenes. Um, and in the meantime, I thought we'd answer some questions. So one theme that has come up throughout the questions, and Jessica, I thought I might ask you about this first, is the difficult decision that head teachers have to make between weighing up the impact of one child's behaviour on the remaining students in the school, as opposed to what that, the impact of an exclusion is going to have on that, that, um, that individual. And do you have any particular views on how governors and schools can manage that tension? Sorry, rookie error muted. Um, I think that it's, it's a, 
persistent challenge, isn't it? Um, because res resource in a mainstream school is finite. Resource in an alternative setting is also finite. Um, we need to be clear about that. There is no over the rainbow where things are completely different. Um, and that's a, an important factor to bear in mind. But um, schools do have to make the best possible use of the resources that they have to educate all of the young people they have in front of them. And sometimes that does mean a really difficult choice. But I, I think that the, the question around it's, it's not either or. So you don't necessarily have to go to a false binary. If this child can't be in our school, must they be excluded? Because actually, there are a range of different things that you might well be looking at as alternatives to exclusion. For example, is the case that that young person actually is in need of an EHCP? And therefore, you would be looking at different methods of moving the three cycles of assessment forward. And that might be that you do that through temporary placement in a different setting. You might have specialist ed SEND alternative provision available to you um, or SEMH alternative provision for the period only of that EHCP where you as a school and your SENCO are going to continue to monitor, visit, uh, um, uh, intervene, supervise and have input to that EHCP so that as and when it is secured, you can then be part of the conversation with that family about naming the appropriate provision for that young person. So it might be that you've decided that the right outcome is that because of persistent be breach or one-off significant behaviour, the right setting isn't your school. But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to move to exclusion. You might be looking at a managed move to a school that is better placed to support that young person. And that might be because it has a specialist resource base for SEND. It might be because it's an awful lot smaller. It might be because one of the issues is that they're so far away from home or that there's a concern in the local community and you need to remove them from that. So I think one of the helpful ways that governors and school leaders can really engage in that horrible decision about, ooh, is it, is it at the cost of other students, is to think about meaningful, helpful and productive alternatives for that young people that don't necessarily mean exclusion. That's brilliant. Thanks, Jessica. And actually, you just touched on managed moves at the end there. And again, another theme that has come out in the question is in managed moves. Do schools, the receiving school, do they have any choice about who to accept? And if they do, does that mean that some students risk not being accepted anywhere? So a managed move is not is not a, a, a sort of a statutory entitlement. Um, it's a case by case basis and it um, depends upon uh, the relationships between schools, the capacities that schools, ha schools have to support uh, young people and other schools within their trusts and their local areas. It depends uh, entirely on the, the issue with the young person. So, for example, you might feel as a head teacher, there's been such a significant health and safety concern with around this young person's behaviour that currently I cannot in good conscience recommend them to another mainstream provider without some intervention first. So you might be looking at a two-step process because um, what will happen then is uh, with a managed move you also have to have the buy-in of the family. So old school or, or current school if you like, um, family and receiving school will usually arrange a meeting to together um, to talk about why that young person really feels that they are ready to make a, a good use of a fresh start, what kind of behaviours they are ready to change, what sort of support they will need to do that and then the, you need uh, you can have a maximum of about 12 weeks on that trial period during which if it doesn't work you're, you're becoming again the responsibility of your original school school and they may need to move to an exclusion at that point or if it's successful you're going on roll to the mainstream um, second provider um, but most schools choose to make that period a lot shorter because that's an awfully long time when you take into account that there could be you know a summer holiday in between or an Easter holiday in between and in the interim the child is not really feeling like they're necessarily a member of the right school community so the home school really needs to do quite a lot of work in checking in, reviewing, uh, keeping that young person focused. And then in an ideal world, you want a review meeting at somewhere between six and eight weeks. If there are any concerns, set some more targets and then review again in sort of three, four weeks um, with a view to either moving them permanently onto that role or coming up with an alternative solution. Thanks very much, Jessica. 
we're, we're going to go back to Edward Timpson, MP now. We have had a few um, technical issues behind the scenes, but Edward is on the line, even if we might not be able to see him. Um, Edward Timpson, MP, was elected for, as MP for Edisbury in 2019, and before that he was MP for Crewe and Nantwich from 2008 to 2017. As I'm sure you all know, he led the review of schools exclusions, um, which set out to explore why schools use exclusions and why the impact is different on certain groups of children, including in particular children in need in care or from certain ethnic groups and why those, those groups are more likely to be excluded. That review made a number of recommendations to try and ensure that exclusion is used appropriately and consistently and to make sure our schools have a great system for every child to thrive and progress. So, um, Edward, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great, thanks so much, Jane. I'm terribly sorry that my technical um, sort of uh, fallout has uh, prevented you from seeing me. You've been spared my lockdown hair, though, so you know, there's some silver lining. Um, and actually, rather than being the sort of the top of the agenda and doing the scene setting, it's been really helpful to hear from from, Jess, from Jessica, from Jamie, and, and Samira. I actually wish I'd had them on my expert group for my. Uh, for my review, it would have uh, probably uh, helped short circuit a lot of the uh, the evidence I was trying to find. But uh, it's now uh, a couple of years nearly since the, that review was published and I was first commissioned three years ago. And it, in many ways, much of what I found then remains uh, very uh, pertinent and appertaining even now, uh, not least uh, the uh, exacerbation of much of what uh, we're talking about as we going through the, the period of, of COVID recovery. Uh, I, I did have a background of uh, fostering, which my parents fostered about 90 children, I've got two adopted brothers, so exclusion was quite a regular feature um, of my upbringing. Uh, and as we heard from the other panellists, this, this is an issue uh, that isn't new. And actually, if you look, the numbers peaked in 2006-07 for fixed term exclusion and the late 90s for, for permanent exclusion. Uh, but the, the, the real question for my review was since 2013-14, why have those numbers started to rise again? Uh, and um, of course, when you sort of break down what those numbers mean, uh, you know, there's 8 million children at school, 0.1% who are being ex excluded in 2016-17. It doesn't sound very many as 0.1%, but that translates to 40 children every day. Uh, and, but within that, there is substantial variation in the, the, the rise of exclusion across the school system. So again, because it was the, the year I was, uh, most recent year I was looking at, academic year 2016-17, uh, in that year, 54% of permanent exclusions were in just a quarter of the highest excluding local authority areas. But there were 17,000 mainstream schools that had no permanent exclusions at, at all. And if we look at fixed term exclusions, 43% of mainstream schools didn't have any. Uh, but if you really dug down into the detail, you found 38 schools that had over 500 fixed term exclusions in a year. So there's massive variation across the system. Uh, and uh, my review identified, and since trying to understand that, that essentially building on uh, the, the excellent presentation we've already had, that they fall into what I call in-school factors and out-of-school factors. So in-school factors would be the, the policy and the practice within your school, as well as in the wider education system, and potentially going back to the point about place um, in, in an area, a local authority area, for example. And then out-of-school factors would be things like like poverty, uh, a child and family's individual circumstances, uh, or something like the impact of, of trauma uh, in their early life. And they, they all need to be taken into account when considering what is the best response for each individual child. And what sort of children are we talking about? Well, again, we've heard a lot about the characteristics. And in, in my review, we found 78% of permanently excluded children had either a special educational need, were a child in need, uh, or on a free school meal. In fact, 11 percent, all three of those. Uh, and as Jamie said, uh, boys are disproportionately represented in exclusion, 80 percent uh, on average, 90 percent in primary schools, although the numbers are much lower in primary. And on ethnicity, it's a very complex picture because you look at uh, black Caribbean children who are 1.7 times more likely to be permanently excluded than white British children. But Bangladesh and Indian children are half as likely. And that's why I think going back to those in school factors and out of school factors and trying to uh, run them against uh, the circumstances of each individual child is the best way of understanding um, how that is playing out for them uh, in their own life. The consequences we know, 
uh, the worst long-term trajectories if exclusion features in, in your school career are, are very clear. Jamie spoke about those. 23% um, of young offenders serving sentence of less than 12 months custody have been permanently excluded. Um, you, can't, you can't deny that the correlation uh, there. And uh, I, I wasn't asked to consider the powers of, of heads to exclude as a, a tool of last resort when nothing else will do, but I'm, I'm very much with the other panelists. I think this is something that schools do need to have um, as uh, a potential uh, tool that they need to use in, in very hopefully limited circumstances. But much of the debate about how to approach this issue has, um, in, in particular around the roots of challenging behaviour, I found in my review tended to fall into two camps. There were those who thought it was a choice or sort of an inevitable consequence of a, a lack of boundaries. And then there were those who saw it as a, a way of trying to communicate around some of their unmet needs or early life uh, issues um, that they've had and, and current problems at home or in the environment that they're living in. And the truth is it's, it's actually a combination of all those things. But um, I was clear in my review, and I think this is something that governors uh, need to articulate themselves is that by having a well-ordered school environment with, with clear rules, values and expectations around behaviour, that doesn't need to be mutually exclusive from or inconsistent with a policy of inclusivity and personalised pupil support. Because uh, when we look at the drivers of current practice, and I found in my review, they homed in on, on leadership, so it's about setting the right culture and standards, how your staff deliver them. It's about behaviour management insight, recognising that every child will manifest it in a different way. Ask the question, why? Uh, it's a lack of incentives to do the right thing in some circumstances, and also a bit of skewed accountability. And one of my key recommendations was around actually holding schools much more responsible for children that they exclude. Um, and that isn't helped by some of the lack of safeguards around some of the informal uh, exclusion um, that, that we know about. Often that's an area where governors are less cited on and ones where uh, there needs to be greater transparency. So, so right, my recommendations, in, especially in relation to governors, uh, was uh, to look in particular at repeated fixed term exclusions that we've heard about, uh, because that's often the, one of the first indicators of failure, uh, that some of the, the interventions are not working, um, and to try and get in front of the problem, to break that destructive cycle of, of poor behaviour. Um, and uh, amongst that, I looked at practice improvement, and I'm still pushing for a practice improvement fund uh, to be set up in the DfE to look at effective use of internal inclusion units, uh, nurture groups, pastoral support, the transition uh, that was spoken about earlier, as well as that proactive use of alternative provision as, a, as an early intervention. And something else that's, that's been uh, well, um, well talking about today, and that's the better use of data because that can act as a really great early warning system in spotting trends and issues both within your school, but also across schools where they're, they're talking about um, the response uh, to either moving children from one place to another through managed moves uh, or doing an off-site direction to, to alternative provision. Uh, so, so try to get your hands a much richer data based around characteristics um, and the deeper understanding of what is driving um, some of the responses within the school will mean that you're better equipped to ask the right questions uh, when you're meeting with with the head and with teachers uh, and hopefully uh, I would like to see um, talking to other governors and other schools about how they're managing this as well and then there's also the need to improve the knowledge and skills of staff um, so that they really understand the underlying causes of behavior um, I'm all, I've always been big on attachment and trauma um, it's great to have Jamie on the, from the difference here. I've worked very closely with Kieran Gill there so that we can start to uh, pull that much closer into uh, not just AP, but mainstream thinking um, and understanding about how best to respond. Uh, and then, as I said, about accountability, how we, how we can ensure that there's a real um, clear incentive for, for schools to continue to show a direct interest in children who may need to move away from mainstream for a period of time. Um, and I think that's ultimately where, where governors come in. And I'm not sh sure everyone will have read the report, but you'll find on page 88 and 89 and recommendation 17, uh, it talks about how we need to build the capacity and capability of governors and trustees so they can offer that really effective support and challenge to schools and school leaders. And I really like Samira's idea that was discussed about how that can be brought much closer to the children, young people themselves and involving them to ensure that exclusion and other pupil moves like managed moves and so on are really used, used properly. 
And for that, um, I'd also said that we need enhanced training for, uh, for governors uh, and a really good accessible guidance so you're clear about where you can probe through your professional curiosity, um, as well as access to that real-time data. Um, because I, I think um, children at risk of exclusion, um, if you don't know about them as a body of governors uh, at an earlier stage, you're not in a position to start to change the trajectory uh, that the school is working towards to ensure that where possible, um, they can work with them so they remain in, in mainstream. Um, I've also saw examples of schools who had behaviour panels to try and pull together a team around a child. I think that's something governors could get involved, involved in as well. Um, and I think building relationships uh, with other, other local schools and having a governor's network where you're talking about these things across schools uh, will also enhance the impact that you're having um, on how, how we handle exclusion. Um, as I said, I know we're coming up against time now, but yeah, I think COVID will have exposed and exacerbated more children's propensity to struggle at school. So I think this makes it even more important that we really understand and act upon uh, the, the impact of exclusion and only use it where it is absolutely necessary. So, so we can ensure improved outcomes for all children uh, who would otherwise uh, currently be can the candidates for uh, being asked to leave their school. And, and as Samira said, it's about making the vulnerable visible and uh, governors have an absolutely key role in doing that. Um, so I would, my best advice I can give you is take the advice that you've heard from the other panellists, because um, I think that really sets the standard uh, that we can all achieve if we do the collective effort um, that will make a difference for those children who otherwise uh, would fall on the wrong side of exclusion. So on that, Jane, back to you. Thank you very much, Edward. And between your, your input and that of Jessica, Jane and Samira, I think there's been plenty for our governors to get their teeth into and lots of themes running through the session including the importance of data, um, the getting involved at an earlier stage and the use of in-school alternatives. We are, we are going to have another webinar coming up um, which we will let you know all the details of and that's going to focus on how governors can probe and challenge effectively in the area of school exclusion. So we have another opportunity to revisit this. Um, as we're almost at half one, I'm, I'm going to wrap up now and, and thank Jessica, Jamie, Samira and Edward for all of your input into this and everybody um, watching for joining in. We have had lots of comments saying thank you for um, all the information and many comments also asking about where some of the slides and information mentioned in the in the session can be obtained and we will we will look at those and come back to you. So thank you everyone for joining and um, enjoy the rest of your day.